The Book by Margaret Irwin, 1930 On a foggy night in November, Mr. Corbett, having guessed the murderer by the third chapter of his detective story, arose in disappointment from his bed and went downstairs in search of something more satisfactory to send him to sleep. The fog had crept through the closed and curtained windows of the dining room, and hung thick on the air in a silence that seemed as heavy and breathless as the fog. The atmosphere was more choking than in his room, and very chill, although the remains of a large fire still burned in the grate. The dining room bookcase was the only considerable one in the house, and held a careless, unselected collection to suit all the tastes of the household, together with a few dull and obscure old theological books that had been left over from the sale of a learned uncle's library. Cheap red novels bought on railway stalls by Mrs. Corbett, who thought a journey the only time to read, were thrust in like pert, undersized intruders amongst the respectable 19th century works of culture, chastely bound in dark blue or green, which Mr. Corbett had considered the right thing to buy during his Oxford days. Beside these, there swaggered the children's large, gaily bound storybooks and collections of fairy tales in every colour. From among this neat, new, cloth-bound crowd there towered here and there a musty sepulchre of learning, brown with the colour of dust rather than leather, with no trace of gilded letters, however faded, on its crumbling back to tell what lay inside. A few of these moribund survivors from the Dean's Library were inhospitably fastened with rusty clasps, all remained closed, and appeared impenetrable, their blank, forbidding backs uplifted above their frivolous surroundings, with the air of scorn that belongs to a private and concealed knowledge. For only the worm of corruption now bored his way through their evil-smelling pages. It was an unusual flight of fancy for Mr. Corbett to imagine that the vaporous and fog-ridden air that seemed to hang more thickly about the bookcase was like a dank and poisonous breath exhaled by one or other of these slowly rotting volumes. Discomfort in this pervasive and impalpable presence came on him more acutely than at any time that day, In an attempt to clear his throat of it, he choked most unpleasantly. He hurriedly chose a Dickens from the second shelf as appropriate to a London fog, and had returned to the foot of the stairs when he decided that his reading tonight should, by contrast, be of blue Italian skies and white statues in beautiful rhythmic sentences. He went back for a Walter Pater. He found Marius the Epicurean tipped sideways across the gap left by his withdrawal of the old curiosity shop. It was a very wide gap to have been left by a single volume, for the books on that shelf had been closely wedged together. He put the Dickens back into it and saw that there was still space for a large book. He said to himself, in careful and precise words, "'This is nonsense.' No one can possibly have gone into the dining room and removed a book while I was crossing the hall. There must have been a gap before in the second shelf. But another part of his mind kept saying in a hurried, tumbled torrent, There is no gap in the second shelf. There was no gap in the second shelf. He snatched at both the Marius and the old curiosity shop, and went to his room in a haste that was unnecessary and absurd, since even if he believed in ghosts, which he did not, no one had the smallest reason for suspecting any in the modern Kensington house wherein he and his family had lived for the last fifteen years. Reading was the best thing to calm the nerves, 
and Dickens a pleasant, wholesome, and robust author. Tonight, however, Dickens struck him in a different light. Beneath the author's sentimental pity for the weak and helpless, he could discern a revolting pleasure in cruelty and suffering, whilst the grotesque figures of the people in Crookshank's illustrations revealed too clearly the hideous distortions of their souls. What had seemed humorous now appeared diabolic, and in disgust at these two favourites, he turned to Walter Pater for the repose and dignity of a classic spirit. But presently, he wondered if this spirit were not in itself of a marble quality, frigid and lifeless, contrary to the purpose of nature. I have often thought, he said to himself, that there is something evil in the austere worship of beauty for its own sake. He had never thought so before, but he liked to think that this impulse of fancy was the result of mature consideration, and with this satisfaction he composed himself for sleep. He woke two or three times in the night, an unusual occurrence, But he was glad of it, for each time he had been dreaming horribly of these blameless Victorian works. Sprightly devils in whiskers and peg-top trousers tortured a lovely maiden and leered in delight at her anguish. The gods and heroes of classic fable acted deeds whose naked crime and shame Mr. Corbett had never appreciated in Latin and Greek unscenes. When he had woken in a cold sweat from the spectacle of the ravished Philomel's torn and bleeding tongue, he decided there was nothing for it but to go down and get another book that would turn his thoughts in some more pleasant direction. But his increasing reluctance to do this found a hundred excuses. The recollection of the gap in the shelf now occurred to him with a sense of unnatural importance. In the troubled dozes that followed, this gap between two books seemed the most hideous deformity, like a gap between the front teeth of some grinning monster. But in the clear daylight of the morning, Mr. Corbett came down to the pleasant dining room, its sunny windows and smell of coffee and toast, and ate an undiminished breakfast with a mind chiefly occupied in self-congratulation that the wind had blown the fog away in time for his Saturday game of golf. Whistling happily, he was pouring out his final cup of coffee, when his hand remained arrested in the act as his glance, roving across the bookcase, noticed there was now no gap at all in the second shelf. He asked who had been at the bookcase already, but neither of the girls had, nor Dickie, and Miss Corbett was not yet down. The maid never touched the books. They wanted to know what book he missed in it, which made him look foolish, as he could not say. The things that disturb us at midnight are negligible at 9am. I thought there was a gap in the second shelf, he said, but it doesn't matter. There never is a gap in the second shelf, said little Jean, brightly. You can take out lots of books from it, and when you go back, the gap's always filled up. Haven't you noticed that? I have. Nora, the middle one in age, said Jean was always being silly. She had been found crying over the funny pictures in The Rose and the Ring, because she said all the people in them had such wicked faces and the picture of a black cat had upset her because she thought it was a witch. Mr. Corbett did not like to think of such fancies for his genie. She retaliated briskly by saying Dicky was just as bad, and he was a big boy. He had kicked a book across the room and said filthy stuff, just like that. Jean was a good mimic. Her tone expressed a venom of disgust, and she had made the gesture of dropping a book as though the very touch of it were loathsome. Dicky, who had been making violent signs at her, now told her she was a beastly little sneak, and he would never again take her for rides on the step of his bicycle.
Mr. Corbett was disturbed. Unpleasant housemaids and bad school friends passed through his head as he gravely asked his son how he had got hold of this book. "'Took it out of that bookcase, of course,' said Dickie furiously. It turned out to be the boys Gulliver's Travels that Granny had given him, and Dickie had at last to explain his rage with the devil who wrote it to show that men were worse than beasts and the human race a washout. A boy who never had good school reports had no right to be so morbidly sensitive as to penetrate the underlying cynicism of Swift's delightful fable, and that, moreover, in the bright and carefully expurgated edition they bring out nowadays. Mr. Corbett could not say he had ever noticed the cynicism himself, though he knew from the critical books it must be there, and with some annoyance he advised his son to take out a nice bright modern boy's adventure story that could not depress anybody. It appeared, however, that Dickie was off-reading just now, and the girls echoed this. Mr. Corbett soon found that he too was off-reading. Every new book seemed to him weak, tasteless, and insipid, while his old and familiar books were depressing, or even in some obscure way, disgusting. Authors must all be filthy-minded. They probably wrote what they dared not express in their lives. Stevenson had said that literature was a morbid secretion, he read Stevenson again to discover his peculiar morbidity, and detected in his essays a self-pity masquerading as courage, and in Treasure Island an invalid's sickly attraction to brutality. This gave him a zest to find out what he disliked so much, and his taste for reading revived as he explored with relish the hidden infirmities of minds that had been valued by fools as great and noble. He saw Jane Austen and Charlotte Bronte as two unpleasant examples of spinsterhood, the one as a prying sub-acid busybody in everyone else's flirtations, the other as a raving, craving maenad seeking self-immolation on the altar of her frustrated passions. He compared Wordsworth's love of nature to the monstrous egoism of an ancient bellwether isolated from the flock. These powers of penetration astonished him. With a mind so acute and original, he should have achieved greatness, yet he was a mere solicitor, and not prosperous at that. If he had but the money, he might do something with those ivory shares, but it would be a pure gamble, and he had no luck. His natural envy of his wealthier acquaintances now mingled with a contempt for their stupidity that approached loathing. That the digestion of his lunch in the city was ruined by meeting sentimental yet successful dotards who he had once regarded as pleasant fellows. The very sight of them spoiled his game of golf, so that he came to prefer reading alone in the dining room, even on sunny afternoons. He discovered also, and with a slight shock, that Mrs. Corbett had always bored him. Dicky he began to actively dislike as an impudent blockhead, and the two girls were as insipidly alike as white mice. It was a relief when he abolished their tiresome habit of coming in to say good night. In the now unbroken silence and seclusion of the dining room, he read with feverish haste as though he were seeking for some clue to knowledge, some secret key to existence which would quicken and inflame it, transform it from its present dull torpor to a life worthy of him and his powers. He even explored the few decaying remains of his uncle's theological library. Bored and baffled, he yet persisted, and had the occasional relief of an ugly woodcut of Adam and Eve with figures like bolsters and hair like dahlias, or a map of the cosmos with hell mouth in the corner, belching forth demons. One of these books had diagrams and symbols in the margin, which he took to be mathematical formulae of a kind he did not know. He presently discovered that they were drawn, not printed, and that the book was in manuscript, and 
in a very neat, crabbed black writing that resembled black letter printing. It was, moreover, in Latin, a fact that gave Mr. Corbett a shock of unreasoning disappointment. For while examining the signs in the margin, he had been filled with an extraordinary exultation, as though he knew himself to be on the edge of a discovery that should alter his whole life, but he had forgotten his Latin. With a secret and guilty air, which would have looked absurd to anyone who knew his harmless purpose, he stole to the schoolroom for Dickie's Latin dictionary and grammar, and hurried back to the dining room, where he tried to discover what the book was about, with an anxious industry that surprised himself. There was no name to it, nor of the author. Several blank pages had been left at the end, and the writing ended at the bottom of a page, with no flourish or superscription, as though the book had been left unfinished. From what sentences he could translate, it seemed to be a work on theology rather than mathematics. There were constant references to the master, to his wishes and injunctions, which appeared to be that of a complicated kind. Mr. Corbett began by skipping these as mere accounts of ceremonial, but a word caught his eye as one unlikely to occur in such an account. He read this passage attentively, looking up each word in the dictionary, and could hardly believe the result of his translation. Clearly, he decided, this book must be by some early missionary, and the passage I have just read the account of some horrible rite practiced by savage tribes of devil worshippers. Though he called it horrible, he reflected on it, committing each detail to memory. He then amused himself by copying the signs in the margin near it and trying to discover their significance. But a sensation of sickly cold came over him. His head swam, and he could hardly see the figures before his eyes. He suspected a sudden attack of influenza, and went to ask his wife for medicine. They were all in the drawing room, Mrs. Corbett helping Nora and Jean with a new game, Dickie playing the pianola, and Mike, the Irish terrier who had lately deserted his accustomed place on the dining room hearthrug, stretched by the fire. Mr. Corbett had an instant's impression of this peaceful and cheerful scene, before his family turned towards him and asked in scared tones what was the matter. He thought how like sheep they looked and sounded. Nothing in his appearance in the mirror struck him as odd, It was their gaping faces that were unfamiliar. He then noticed the extraordinary behaviour of Mike, who had sprung from the hearthrug and was crouched in the furthest corner, uttering no sound, but with his eyes distended and foam around his bared teeth. Under Mr. Corbett's glance, he slunk towards the door, whimpering in a faint and abject manner, and then as his master called him, he snarled horribly, and the hair bristled on the scruff of his neck. Dickie let him out, and they heard him scuffling at a frantic rate down the stairs to the kitchen, and then, again and again, a long-drawn howl. "'What can be the matter with Mike?' asked Mrs. Corbett. Her question broke a silence that seemed to have lasted a long time. Jean began to cry. Mr. Corbett said irritably that he did not know what was the matter with any of them. Then Nora asked, "'What is that red mark on your face?' He looked again in the glass and could see nothing. "'It's quite clear from here,' said Dickie. "'I can see lines in the fingerprint.' "'Yes, that's what it is,' said Mrs. Corbett, in her brisk staccato voice. "'The print of a finger on your forehead,' Have you been writing in red ink? Mr. Corbett precipitately left the room for his own, where he sent down a message that he was suffering from headache and would have his dinner in bed. He wanted no one fussing around him. By next morning he was amazed at his fancies of influenza, for he had never felt so well in his life. No one commented on his looks at breakfast, so he concluded that the mark had disappeared, and, 
The old Latin book he had been translating the previous night had been moved from the writing bureau, although Dickie's grammar and dictionary were still there. The second shelf was, as always in the daytime, closely packed. The book had, he remembered, been in the second shelf, but this time he did not ask who had put it back. That day, he had an unexpected stroke of luck in a new client by the name of Crab, who entrusted him with large sums of money. Nor was he irritated by the sight of his more prosperous acquaintances, but with difficulty refrained from grinning in their faces. So confident was he in his remarkable ability must place him soon higher than any of them. At dinner, he chaffed his family with what he felt to be the gaiety of a schoolboy, but on them it had a contrary effect, for they stared, either at him in stupid astonishment, or at their plates, depressed and nervous. Did they think him drunk, he wondered, and a fury came on him at their low and bestial suspicions and heavy dullness of mind. Why, he was younger than any of them. But in spite of this new alertness, he could not attend to the letters he should have written that evening, and drifted to the bookcase for a little light distraction, but found that for the first time there was nothing he wished to read. He pulled out a book from above his head at random and saw it was the old Latin book in manuscript. As he turned over its stiff and yellow pages, he noticed with pleasure the smell of corruption that had at first repelled him in these decaying volumes, a smell, he now thought, of ancient and secret knowledge. This idea of secrecy seemed to affect him personally, for on hearing a step in the hall, he hastily closed the book and put it back in its place. He went to the schoolroom where Dickie was doing his homework, and told him he required his Latin grammar and dictionary again for an old law report. To his annoyance, he stammered and put his words awkwardly. He thought that the boy looked oddly at him, and he cursed him in his heart for a suspicious young devil, though of what he should be suspicious he could not say. Nevertheless, when back in the dining room, he listened at the door and then softly turned the lock before he opened the books on the writing bureau. The script and Latin seemed much clearer than on the previous evening, and he was able to read at random a passage relating the trial of a German midwife in 1620, for the murder and dissection of 783 children. Even allowing for the opportunities afforded by her profession, the number appeared excessive, nor could he discover any motive for the slaughter. He decided to translate the book from the beginning. It appeared to be an account of some secret society, whose activities and ritual were of a nature so obscure, and when not so vile and terrible, that Mr. Corbett would not at first believe that this could be a record of any human mind, although his deep interest in it should have convinced him that from his humanity at least, it was not altogether alien. He read until far later than his usual hour for bed, and when at last he rose, it was with the book in his hands. To defer his parting with it, he stood turning over the pages until he reached the end of the writing, and was struck by a new peculiarity. The ink was much fresher and of a far poorer quality than the thick, rusted ink in the bulk of the book, On close inspection, he would have said it was of modern manufacture, and written quite recently, were it not to the fact that it was in the same crabbed late 17th century handwriting. This, however, did not explain the perplexity, even dismay and fear he now felt as he stared at the last sentence. It ran, Contene te in perenibus studus and he had at once recognised it as a Ciceronian tag that had been dinned into him at school. He could not understand how he had failed to notice it yesterday. Then he remembered that the book had ended at the bottom of a page, but now the last two sentences were written at the very top of a page. However long he looked at them, 
He could come to no other conclusion than that they had been added since the previous evening. He now read the sentence before the last, Re imperfecta mortus sum, and translated the whole as, I died with my purpose unachieved. Continue thou the never-ending studies. With his eyes still fixed upon it, Mr. Corbett replaced the book on the writing bureau and stepped back from it to the door, his hand outstretched behind him, groping and then tugging at the door handle. As the door failed to open, his breath came in faint, hardly articulate screams. Then he remembered that as he himself had locked it, and he fumbled with the key in frantic, ineffectual movements until at last he opened it and banged it after him as he plunged backward into the hall. For a moment, he stood there, looking at the door handle. Then with a stealthy, sneaking movement, his hand crept up towards it, touched it, and began to turn it, when suddenly he pulled his hand away and went up to his bedroom, three steps at a time. There, he behaved in a manner only comparable with the way he had lost his head after losing his innocence when a schoolboy of sixteen. He hid his face in the pillow. He cried. He raved in meaningless words, repeating, Never, never, never. I will never do it again. Help me never to do it again. With the words, Help me, He noticed what he was saying. They reminded him of other words, and he began to pray aloud. But the words sounded jumbled. They persisted in coming into his head in a reverse order, so that he found he was saying his prayers backwards. And at this final absurdity, he suddenly began to laugh very loud. He sat up on the bed, delighted at this return to sanity, common sense, and humour, when the door leading into Mrs. Corbett's room opened, and he saw his wife staring at him with a strange, grey, drawn face that made her seem like the terror-stricken ghost of her usually smug and placid self. "'It's not burglars,' he said irritably. "'I've come to bed late, that is all, and must have waked you.' "'Henry,' said Mrs. Corbett, and he noticed that she had not heard him, Henry, didn't you hear it? What? That laugh. He was silent, an instinctive caution warning him to wait until she spoke again. And this she did, imploring him with her eyes to reassure her. It was not a human laugh. It was like the laugh of a devil. He checked his violent inclination to laugh again. It was wiser not to let her know that it was only his laughter she had heard. He told her to stop being fanciful, and Mrs. Corbett, gradually recovering her docility, returned to obey an impossible command, since she could not stop being what she had never been. The next morning, Mr. Corbett rose before any of the servants and crept down to the dining room. As before, the dictionary and grammar alone remained on the writing bureau. The book was back in the second shelf. He opened it at the end. Two more lines had been added, carrying the writing down to the middle of the page. They ran, Ex Oro Canceris. In dentum elephantus, which he translated as out of the money of the crab into the tooth of the elephant. From this time on, his acquaintances in the city noticed a change in the mediocre, rather flabby, and unenterprising old Corbett. His recent sour depression dropped from him. He seemed to have grown twenty years younger strong, brisk, and cheerful, with a self-confidence in business that struck them as lunacy. They waited with a not unpleasant excitement for the inevitable crash, but his every speculation, however wild and harebrained, turned out successful. He no longer avoided them, but went out of his way to display his consciousness of luck, daring, and vigour, and to chaff them in a manner that began to make him actively disliked.
This he welcomed with delight as a sign of others' envy and his superiority. He never stayed in town for dinners or theatres, for he was always now in a hurry to get home, where, as soon as he was sure of being undisturbed, he would take down the manuscript book from the second shelf of the dining room and turn to the last pages. Every morning he found that a few words had been added since the evening before, and always they formed, as he considered, injunctions to himself. These were at first only with regards to his money transactions, giving assurance to his boldest fancies, and since the brilliant and unforeseen success that had attended his gamble with Mr. Crabbe's money in African ivory, he followed all such advice unhesitatingly. But presently, interspersed with these commands, were others of a meaningless, childish, yet revolting character, such as might be invented by a decadent imbecile, or, it must be admitted, by the idle fancies of any ordinary man who permits his imagination to wander unbridled. Mr. Corbett was startled to recognise one or two such fancies of his own, which had occurred to him during his frequent boredom in church, and which he had not thought any other mind could conceive. He at first paid no attention to these directions, but found that his new speculations declined so rapidly that he became terrified not merely for his fortune, but for his reputation and even safety, since the money of various of his clients was involved. It was made clear to him that he must follow the commands in the book altogether or not at all, and he began to carry out their puerile and grotesque blasphemies with a contemptuous amusement, which, however, gradually changed to a sense of their monstrous significance. They became more capricious and difficult of execution, but he now never hesitated to obey blindly, urged by a fear that he could not understand, but knew only that it was not of mere financial failure. By now he understood the effect of this book on the others near it, and the reason that had impelled its mysterious agent to move the books into the second shelf so that all in turn should come under the influence of that ancient and secret knowledge. In respect to it, he encouraged his children, with jeers at their stupidity, to read more, but he could not observe that they ever now took a book from the dining room bookcase. He himself no longer needed to read, but went to bed early and slept sound, the things that all his life he had longed to do when he should have enough money now seemed to him insipid. His most exciting pleasure was the smell and touch of these mouldering pages as he turned them to find the last message inscribed to him. One evening, it was in two words only, Canum Osside. He laughed at this simple and pleasant request to kill the dog, for he bore Mike a grudge for his change from devotion to slinking aversion. Moreover, it could not have come more opportunely, since in turning out an old desk, he had just discovered some packets of rat poison, bought years ago and forgotten. No one therefore knew of its existence, and it would be easy to poison Mike without any further suspicion than that of a neighbour's carelessness. He whistled light-heartedly as he ran upstairs to rummage for the packets, and returned to empty one in the dog's dish of water in the hall. That night the household was awakened by terrified screams proceeding from the stairs. Mr. Corbett was the first to hasten there, prompted by the instinctive caution that was always with him these days. He saw Jean, in a nightdress, scrambling up to the landing on her hands and knees, clutching at anything that afforded support, and screaming in a choking, tearless, unnatural manner. He carried her to the room she shared with Nora, and they were quickly followed by Mrs. Corbett. Nothing coherent could be got from Jean. Nora said that she must have been having her old dream again, when her father demanded what this was, she said that sometimes Jean woke in the night crying because she had dreamed of a hand passing backwards and forwards over the dining room bookcase until it found a certain book and took it out of the shelf. At this point she was always so frightened that she woke up. 
On hearing this, Jean broke into fresh screams, and Mrs. Corbett would have no more explanations. Mr. Corbett went out onto the stairs to find what had brought the child there from her bed. On looking down into the lighted hall, he saw Mike's dish overturned. He went down to examine it and saw that the water he had poisoned must have been upset and absorbed by the rough doormat, which was quite wet. He went back to the little girl's room, told his wife that she was tired and must go to bed, and he would take his turn at comforting Jean. She was now much quieter. He took her on his knee, where at first she shrank from him. Mr. Corbett remembered with an angry sense of injury that she never now sat on his knee, and would have liked to pay her out of it by mocking and frightening her. But he had to coax her into telling him what he wanted, and with this object he soothed her, calling her by pet names that he thought he had forgotten, telling her that nothing could hurt her now that he was with her. At first, his cleverness amused him. He chuckled softly when Jean buried her head in his dressing gown, but presently an uncomfortable sensation came over him. He gripped at Jean as though for her protection while he was so smoothly assuring her of this. With difficulty, he listened to what he had at last induced her to tell him. She and Nora had kept Mike with them all the evening, and taken him to sleep in their room for a treat. He had lain at the foot of Jean's bed, and they had all gone to sleep. Then Jean began her old dream of the hand moving over the books in the dining room bookcase, but instead of taking out a book, it came across the dining room and out onto the stairs. It came up the banisters and to the door of their room, and turned their door handle very softly and opened it. At this point, she jumped up wide awake and turned on the light, calling to Nora. The door, which had been shut when they went to sleep, was wide open, and Mike was gone. She told Nora that she was sure something dreadful would happen to him if she did not go and bring him back, and ran down the hall where she saw him just about to drink from his dish. She called to him, and he looked up, but he did not come, so she ran to him and began to pull him along with her, when her nightdress was clutched from behind and she felt a hand seize her arm. She fell down and then clambered upstairs as fast as she could, screaming all the way. It was now clear to Mr. Corbett that Mike's dish must have been upset in the scuffle, She was again crying, but this time he felt himself unable to comfort her. He retired to his room, where he walked up and down in an agitation he could not understand, for he found his thoughts perpetually arguing on a point that had never troubled him before. "'I am not a bad man,' he kept saying to himself. "'I have never done anything actually wrong.' My clients are none the worse for my speculations, only for the better, nor have I spent my new wealth on gross and sensual pleasures. These now have even no attraction for me. Presently, he added, it is not wrong to try and kill a dog, an ill-tempered brute. It turned against me. It might have bitten Jeanie. He noticed that he had thought of her as Jeanie, which he had not done for some time, It must have been because he had called her that tonight. He must forbid her ever to leave her room at night. He could not have her meddling. It would be safer for him if she were not there at all. Again, that sick and cold sensation of fear swept over him. He seized the bedpost as though he were falling and held on to it for some minutes. I was thinking of a boarding school, he told himself. And then, I must go down and and find out, find out. He would not think what it was he must find out. He opened his door and listened. The house was quiet. He crept onto the landing and along to Nora's and Jean's door, where again he stood, listening. There was no sound, and at that he was again overcome with unreasonable terror. He imagined Jean lying very still in her bed, too still. He hastened away from the door, shuffling in his bedroom slippers along the passage and down the stairs. 
A bright fire still burned in the dining room grate. A glance at the clock told him it was not yet twelve. He stared at the bookcase. In the second shelf was a gap, which had not been there when he had left. On the writing bureau lay a large open book. He knew that he must cross the room and see what was written on it. Then, as before, words that he did not intend came sobbing and crying to his lips, muttering, No, 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 not that. Never, never, never. But he crossed the room and looked down at the book. As last time, the message was only two words. In phantom, oside. He slipped and fell forward against the bureau. His hand clutched at the book, lifted it as he recovered himself, and with his finger he traced out the words that had been written. The smell of corruption crept into his nostrils. He told himself that he was not a snivelling dotard, but a man stronger and wiser than his fellows, superior to the common emotions of humanity, who held in his hands the sources of ancient and secret power. He had known what the message would be. It was, after all, the only safe and logical thing to do. Jean had acquired dangerous knowledge. She was a spy, an antagonist. That she was so unconsciously, that she was eight years old, his youngest and favourite child, were sentimental appeals that could make no difference to a man of sane reasoning power such as his own. Jean had sided with Mike against him. All that are not with me are against me, he repeated softly. He would kill both dog and child with the white powder that no one knew to be in his possession. It would be quite safe. He laid down the book and went to the door. What he had to do, he would do quickly, for again that sensation of deadly cold was sweeping over him, He wished he had not to do it tonight. Last night it would have been easier, but tonight she had sat on his knee and made him afraid. He imagined her lying very still in her bed, too still. But it would be she who would lie there, not he, so why should he be afraid? He was protected by ancient and secret powers. He clung to it, crouched and shivering, bending over it until he knelt on the ground, his head beneath the handle which he clutched with upraised hands. Suddenly the hands were loosened and flung outwards with a frantic gesture of a man falling in from a great height, and he stumbled to his feet. He seized the book and threw it on the fire. A violent sensation of choking overcame him. He felt he was being strangled as in a nightmare. He tried again and again to shriek aloud, but his breath would make no sound. His breath would not come at all. He fell backwards heavily, down on the floor, where he lay very still. In the morning, the maid who had come to open the dining room windows found her master dead. The sensation caused by this was scarcely so great in the city as that given by the simultaneous collapse of all Mr. Corbett's recent speculations— It was instantly assumed that he must have had previous knowledge of this, and so committed suicide. The stumbling block to this theory was that the medical report defined the cause of Mr. Corbett's death as strangulation of the windpipe by the pressure of a hand which had left the marks of its fingers on his throat.' 